start. Okay. Hi, hello everyone, and welcome to this uh, second day of the ASELC annual uh, conference on new law and social justice. Uh, my name is Ivan Naiseluis, and I'm assistant professor at ASELC working on law, political economy, and gender. Um, so yesterday we started with a conversation on migrations um, and the ways in which EU policy and law um, addresses uh, what is often um, uh, what is often described as the as the migration crisis. And um, we explored the limits of the EU uh, policies and legal discourse, and in particular. Uh, this uh, notion that uh, the EU Commission puts forward that it is a win-win sort of situation. It's a win for sending states, it's a win for, uh, for receiving states, it's a win for, for immigrants. Um, it was a really wonderful conversation with, uh, with Janine, who, who, who is here, uh, Annette, um, Charlotte, Betty Dehart, and Iris Golder lang from, from, from Zagreb, where they explored the limits of this sort of win-win discourse showing how immigration policies um, actually uh, burden immigrants who, and I'm gonna uh, take some of the words that were that were mentioned yesterday, who as Janine uh, explained are, are pretty much invisible in the policy policy process um, and very much burdened by, by, by these, by these um, laws. So today we're gonna, uh, talk about discriminations and the role of EU discrimination, but only EU discrimination law, but also uh, I hope we're gonna also talk about that. Other fields of EU law play in reproducing inequalities based on gender, race, class, and other what we call identity uh, markers and, and, and how EU law uh, can address them. And so it is truly a pleasure to welcome our speakers. I will briefly introduce them, um, but it won't do justice to their extensive work and their trajectory. So uh, we have uh, with us Iola Solanke, who is professor of EU law and social justice at the Faculty of Law at Leeds University. Uh, she wrote extensively on EU discrimination law, labor law, gender and race, among others. And uh, her book, uh, Discrimination as Stigma, um, a theory of anti-discrimination uh, law published in 2017, uses the notion of stigma to reconceptualize discrimination law, anti-discrimination law theory using examples from various jurisdictions, including EU, uh, the EU. Our next speaker is Josh Shaw, who holds the Salvesine Chair of European Institutions in the School of Law at the University of Edinburgh. Um, her work sits at the intersection of EU citizenship law, um, EU constitutional law and gender discrimination. And for those of you who are working on gender discrimination, I particularly recommend rereading her a piece that she co-authored with Tamara Harvey, um, and it was published in 1998, entitled Women, Work and Care, Women's Dual Role and Double Burden in EC Sex Equality Law. I think that it puts a lot of our conversation on EU law, gender equality and care into perspective. So I, I really recommend um, that piece. And finally, Ulad Belavusu, who, Belavusu, who is a senior researcher at the ASER Institute, uh, where he works on EU discrimination and constitutional law, as well as on human rights and memory politics. He recently co-edited, it's some, someplace here, uh, he recently co-edited a wonderful collection of essays um, on discrimination, uh, anti-discrimination law, entitled Discrimination Law Beyond uh, Gender, and is currently writing a book um, entitled Sex in the Union, Governance of Sexual Rights in European Law, which is forthcoming in 2022. Uh, Matthias Moschel, as you all know, uh, was supposed to join, but unfortunately due to an uh, um, emergency uh, is unable to, to do so. So thank you so much for being here um, and taking the time to share your thoughts uh, and experiences with us. Uh, about the format, we will start with a conversation between the panelists 
Um, and then we will have around 30, 40 minutes for, uh, for questions and, and answers. So if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand uh, uh, and be concise. Or you can also write your question in the chat um, and we will, uh, um, uh, Lara will, will help me keep an eye on, on, on the chat. Okay, so here's how I would like to start this conversation. Um, each of you has written about the serious limits of EU anti-discrimination law in tackling inequalities in relation to gender, race, socioeconomic status, or, or sexuality. And given how prominent EU anti-discrimination uh, and equality law is in the EU, and given that it is largely perceived as the main field that addresses social inequalities, I wanted to ask you, how do you see the evolutions of the EU anti-discrimination law field? And do you think that this is the right tool for addressing inequalities based on gender, race, class, or other identity markers? So um, I suggest Iola, would you like to start? And then Joe, and then I'll give the floor to, to Ulad. Okay, I'll start. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for, for the invitation. I'm glad to hear that yesterday went well. I'm sorry I wasn't able to join you. I would have loved to, but other, other commitments. Um, so um, I think this, this discussion will be very, very interesting um, to, the honor of kicking it off is a, a, a big, uh, big challenge. I'll do my best. So the evolution of, of European Union um, uh, discrimination law. Well, um, yeah, I mean, um, you, you described it as being prominent. I'm not sure I would actually describe it as, as being very prominent. I still, I don't think it has um, much visibility uh, within um, many of the member states. Um, in particular, uh, I don't think pro protection from discrimination on the grounds of race has much visibility among the member states. Um, and I think that's an area where there is still uh, a lot of scope um, to, to be made. Gender, okay, I think the, the EU has actually uh, made a lot of progress there. Still obviously uh, some way to go, but there is definitely more awareness of gender discrimination law um, age discrimination law as well, interestingly, even though that's a, a, a newer um, uh, ground of protection. <clears throat> um, I think in relation to, to the, the questions that you, you sent us to, 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 to think about, um, whether it's the right tool to address discrimination in, in per se, you know, even before we start to think about the, the evolution, I think it's one tool of many. Um, and I, I think that if we, we need to think about the, the development of EU discrimination law, we need to continue to find ways to um, work with the Commission to, to develop it, to enhance it, um, to broaden it, to, to make not just lawmakers in the member states, but also um, the, the affected communities in the member states aware of this law. But in addition to being aware of the law, we need to find a way to um, encourage and support uh, the presumed beneficiaries. So one of the reasons I think that the, the race strand, the race protection in EU law is underdeveloped is because um, individuals in the member states are, don't know about it, one, uh, but also may not have the confidence to use it because the, the infrastructure in the member states um, doesn't um, instill confidence in them in terms of um, access to, to um, some kind of legal aid or access to some kind of uh, um, support to bring, bring cases, to bring complaints, um, but also because there, there just isn't a, a, a general social conversation um, about race in most of the, the uh, member states of the EU. Well, actually, now that the UK isn't a member state, I can perhaps say all of the other member states, all of the member states of the, the, the EU. And that has a, an impact on the, not just awareness of anti-racial discrimination law, but also the, um, the confidence in, in using it. Uh, there's a, the social context 
of, of law is, is very important and particularly important when you're talking about, uh, <coughs> sorry, sen sensitive and sometimes controversial areas such as racial discrimination. And if there isn't a general social conversation about uh, a particular topic, then it, it will be it will be very difficult um, to to rely upon any legal protection that's given. That's from the side of the complainant. From the side of the the profession, it also becomes uh, difficult to to think about using um, that particular uh, strand of law um, because the you'll be bringing a very difficult argument before the courts, um, one that might be rejected by the courts and, you know, lawyers like to win, um, not just for, for the, their clients, but also um, for themselves. You know, there is some professional pride in, in successfully um, defending the rights of your, of your client. So if there isn't that social conversation, that also impedes uh, the development of a, a, a legal discourse um, in, the, in the national sphere. And if that legal discourse isn't developed, then that um, hinders the, the willingness to bring those cases before a judge. And then um, if you do bring them before the judge, it means that it's twice as hard to, to, to win those um, discussions. So that's about the law. But I do think we need to take um, a broader approach to tackling discrimination um, in the member states and think beyond EU discrimination. Um, so you already mentioned migration. Uh, the, the, the use of immigration and asylum law is an area that we could focus on and the uh, uh, nationality and citizenship law. Um, we could think about um, laws and policies uh, affecting policing, for example. Um, in the UK, in Germany, I'm not sure about France and the Netherlands, but uh, black deaths in custody are a huge issue um, where there is clearly discrimination. Uh, there are, there's data in the United Kingdom showing how dis the, the disproportionality in the numbers of, of young black men who are stopped and searched on the streets, um, but also deaths in custody. So deaths of people in police custody, either uh, in police stations. So if I'm thinking about Yuri Jallo in Germany, or even um, at their home uh, while being arrested by police. And there's a, a recent case that has arisen in Wales, um, which concerned the death of a, a young man called Wyed Bashir. So those are also areas where we can um, look to tackle discrimination, which don't directly uh, link to EU anti-discrimination law. We can also look at healthcare, um, social law, uh, concerning health, concerning housing. So in the United Kingdom, um, we have very clear data on the disproportionate um, infection and deaths amongst uh, Black, Asian, and minority ethnic communities as a result of the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, we also need to think about how we plan a recovery. And all of that, again, is, is separate to uh, discrimination law. Uh, if you think about housing, and the, the Grenfell Towers, um, the, the tragedy at Grenfell Towers uh, uh, two years ago, that again, doesn't directly link to discrimination law, but there is very clearly a, a discrimination element around those types of disasters. Um, I was also going to say something about digital technology and artificial intelligence, but I think Ulad uh, will cover that shortly. So I won't say anything about that. I'll just say a bit more um, about, again, thinking beyond um, EU discrimination law and thinking beyond law to um, to look at those at the demo the demography I suppose of those of us who work in this area. So I'm very very grateful that Ivana you made such an effort to uh, include three black women uh, in this event the, uh, over these uh, two days. But generally um, over the last I don't know 15 20 years that I've been working on EU law. I'm often the only person of colour, uh, not just the only woman of colour, but the only person of colour. So I think we need to look at our field and think about the, the de demographics of it. Why is it so white? Why are there so few Europeans of, of colour um, working in this area, even in discrimination law uh, at the EU level? 
what is happening in education at all levels to create and perpetuate this pattern? I think we need to think about that. Um, and the, perhaps the more we can include diversity in our field of study, the more that will help us to uh, more effectively use EU law in general to tackle discrimination law and then to develop EU discrimination law, particularly in relation to discrimination on grounds of race. So I'll stop there and uh, hand over to somebody else. Thank you, Yola. Um, thank you so much. I just wanted to maybe clarify what I said at the beginning. Um, so when I said that the EU law is prominent, what I meant when addressing inequality is that usually when we go to conferences, right, or when we look at the curriculum, when we talk about gender race class, it's usually in the discrimination, EU discrimination law sort of slot, right? Mm. Uh, and, and, and usually uh, those scholars who feel that there is something to be said about inequalities will sort of naturally gravitate towards the UN anti discrimination law. So that's what I what I wanted I to yeah. sort of just clarify the 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 my question. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you so much for this uh, such a such a rich uh, opening opening uh, introduction. Um, Joe, would you like to uh, would you like to um, pick up on some of the things that were said? Um, yeah, <clears throat> sure. Thank you so much. Thank you for including me in this conversation as well as Iv uh, Ivana. Um, as you say, I've been writing about um, uh, or did write about uh, e EU anti-discrimination law an unfeasibly long time ago. I first published something in um, really in the, the late 80s, beginning of the 90s. So that really is a very, very long time ago. Um, it makes me feel extremely old. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Iola, for that very powerful statement that you made there. I think it's I think it's 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 both true in terms of how you related um, issues of discrimination to broader societal questions or discrimination law and to broader societal questions, but also back to the uh, to the demography of um, of of this this whole. Um, uh, this whole field and of course uh, EU law generally, although it's slightly more feminized than some of the other areas of law that I, I deal with. Um, it's um, where in some areas where when if you're acting as a journal editor, it's extreme, well not, it's extremely hard to get submissions from anyone other than white men. And it's even harder to get uh, reviews from people other than white men because they're so dominant. Or sometimes actually you end up then leaning on the rather few uh, non-hegemonic people in order to to, to try to um, bring them into the conversation, thus giving them even less time to prepare their submissions. But there we go. Um, uh, so th thank you, uh, Iola, and thank you also to to Ivana to the very um, thoughtful way in which you've you've put this together as as a conversation. Um, I I it, it is a very very long time since I wrote anything uh, worthwhile about EU anti discrimination law. Um, uh, twenty more, nearly twenty years now, uh, and by the time I was writing in uh, leaving that that field and moving on to other things, what what I was focusing on less than discrimination law was more on the idea of mainstreaming, um, which has you know had its moment as it were as a as as terminology, but I think as practice it it retains something something useful and something that scholars can play with in terms of how we try to use. Um, um, conceptual technologies in order to uh, to re-engineer th things in such a way that they don't become as much of anti-discrimination law has become, whether that's gender discrimination law or um, race discrimination law or discrimination on grounds of, 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 of um, uh, on, o on other protected grounds so that they, they don't some simply become sort of as so many uh, so much of the case law is like a, a, a clash of different rights or a clash of different interests but rather we try to think about um, think about how we uh, we build from the ground up uh, areas of policy and that 
obviously extends everywhere, as you as you suggest, uh, Ivana, and as um, uh, Iola has also remarked, um, that we build areas of policy that from the ground up take into consideration the fact that, you know, access to voice is extremely, um, uh, is, is, is extremely, uh, uh, problematic for many communities and access to 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 expression of, of uh, articulating interests is 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 very uh, um, is very problematic for many communities and so consequently mo many policies are simply uh, institutionally racist or institutionally sexist or and so on and so forth or institutionally designed around family formations that are you know. Uh, 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 you know, seen as standard family formations or um, seen as white family formations and so on and so forth. So there are so many ways in which we can build policy from the bottom up and lawyers can contribute to that as much as they can, obviously, to, to what becomes sometimes the minefield of discrimination law. So um, from, the, from the beginning, my, my comments on EU anti-discrimination law were always tempered by my overriding interest in in understanding the EU very much in a in a multi-level context so I, I, although I suppose there is a field of EU anti-discrimination law just as there is a I don't know a field of EU company law but we can't or EU environmental law but we really can't understand very much about those fields unless we have a strong grasp as to how they apply at the uh, domestic level. One of the very interesting phenomena that has happened as a consequence of having an overarching su supranational frame for discrimination law has, has of course been idea transfer that has occurred um, as a consequence of the activities of the European Court of Justice which has led to uh, some ideas like around for example indirect discrimination at the very beginning uh, spreading out more, more readily across um, different national systems than they would have done other if, if it had simply been a, an issue of like you know w would a would a constitutional court in one mem in one state look at what a constitutional court is doing say in in another in in another state on on a similar issue yes sometimes they do but very often uh, of course they don't and they plow on as if as if they're building the wheel themselves from from scratch uh, so that does that has speeded up the um, um, there are aspects of the, of the EU's judicial methodology that has uh, speeded up, if you will, some of the processes of, of the, that would take place through com comparative law ideas and so on. But but nonetheless, um, it's always very it's always very difficult, I think, to study any area of, of EU discrimination law without that that domestic uh, perspective. And what um, Iola said I, um, in in her contribution, I absolutely echo, uh, which is the um, the the point about whether or not you know whether or not it's literally feasible in many states uh, to 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 mount that type of of case at the domestic level, how are the judges going to react? Have they had, you know, notwithstanding all the work that's been done on training judges, uh, are they going to have the slightest understanding or empathy for the type of argument that, that you're mounting as a as as a um, uh, as, as a um, uh, as an advocate? And of course, you know, at the end of the day, almost all anti-discrimination law activities are individualized and they have an, an enormous negative <coughs> excuse me can have enormous negative effects for those who end up as the plaintiffs um, as as well as sometimes they can have enormous effects for those who end up as the defendants now you might say well we, do we care about the, the the defendants but sometimes what are institutional problems really become refracted into individualized clashes between two people which which really um, uh, don't reflect the bigger institutional question. So I'm, I've always been fairly convinced that, that anti-discrimination law is a rather weak tool to effect uh, social change. Uh, but nonetheless, of course, it's been conceptually quite interesting, although I don't think I'm anywhere near the best place to um, comment within this Zoom room, uh, the best place to comment on that question. Uh, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there. I think I've talked for longer than I thought I might do as one does that, that you would like to 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 react yeah. to. thank you thank you um 
Ivan, and thank you, Joe and Ulad, for those um, those interventions as well. Very interesting. Um, so yes, I did want to also just uh, correct. I didn't mention positive action or affirmative action. I was just it was a more a descriptive statement rather than a prescriptive statement. Um, it's still the state of the field as it is rather than thinking about how we how we try to address that. Of course, positive action might be one of those ways, but that's um, that wasn't what I was uh, alluding to in my my previous uh, comment. Um, and um, Ivana, when I said the the effort, I didn't mean that it was an extra effort, but the fact that you you made that you thought about this, that was uh, very welcome um, for me. Um, I very much appreciated that. And you picked up on the ULAD statement that I actually also picked up on that the, the work has been done. Um, I'd be interested to hear exactly what work that is, because as far as I'm, I'm aware, ULAD, I completely agree with you. EU law has been tremendously progressive uh, for gender. Uh, but if we add a, a critical race feminist perspective to that, then of course we'll see that's been mainly white women who have benefited uh, from that pro progress, and that's in in um, in in law, that's in politics, uh, that's in education. Um, uh, you mentioned yourself, your field. There seems to be there are many women in discrimination law. There aren't very many women of color. So I think my my point um, stands. If we look at the judiciary as well uh, across Europe, we see many women in in judicial positions, although uh, not many in the the top layers of the judiciary so there is still um, scope for progress but again these are white women not women of color so there there is still I think a, a tremendous amount of work uh, to be done in those areas and also in the, the the most basic area the one that affects all of us here on this call the area of education it still surprises me when I visit other European institutions just the, the lack of diversity. Um, and I want to come now to a point that Joe made about mainstreaming. Mainstreaming has, I think, made some progress over the last 15 years. Um, the fact that we no longer speak about it is because perhaps it's, it's being done more than, than not being done. Um, and one of the ways in which it manifests itself in, in higher education institutes, in institutions in the UK, is through what we call our EDI policies, so policies for equality, diversity, and, and inclusion. Um, so there has been across the UK a concerted effort over the last 15 or 20 years to ensure that um, new entrants to universities or those who are studying their undergraduate degree, so uh, their first degree from the age of 18 to, to 21, that we do have a, a critical mass of um, students of color. And that has, has worked fairly well um, for most institutions who have made this a priority. Um, in my own institution, Leeds, we've done quite well on that aspect. But what we're seeing now is that it's, it's a revolving door. So our, our graduates of color, our students of color will, will come in, will graduate, perhaps not with the best degree, so there's an issue there, but they won't continue into uh, postgraduate study and if they don't continue into postgraduate study then they're not going to be in in a position to apply for any type of lectureship so we have a, a, a problem with what we call the the pipeline so whilst we are mainstreaming and again we find that the the the, the progress of white women in mainstreaming has been significant we find that for for all people of other ethnicities, um, mainstreaming has not worked as well. So that's the realization that we're having, uh, that's the conversation that we're now having across higher education institutions in the United Kingdom. Um, and I'd be interested to know how that mainstreaming has um, been manifested in uh, universities in, in the Netherlands. So has there been uh, a, a, an idea and a, a have, have there been policies to widen participation? So to bring in more students of color in the Netherlands at, uh, to do their first degree, to do their second degree. Are there conversations thinking about diversity amongst the faculty so that when students are sitting in classes, they can see people who look like them and therefore think for themselves, oh, perhaps I can become uh, a professor in future 
because without that, it's unlikely um, to, it's unlikely that the field will become more ethnically diverse and therefore that the mainstreaming will have the, the impact that we want it to, to have. And then I wanted to mention Joe's second comment on the burden of inclusion, because yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, because the, there are so few of us, um, we are asked to do many, many um, things. And I always feel quite guilty when I do have to say no, but obviously you do, you can't, you can't do everything you um, are asked to do, otherwise you end up doing things less well, and then people stop asking. <laughs> So there is, uh, for that reason as well, um, there is a need to, to, to think more about how we can divert, bring more people of colour, people of different ethnicities, people with different voices, as Joe said, people with different experiences to bring to the table, how we can incorporate them into, into the field, discrimination law in particular, but more broadly speaking, in, into EU um, scholarships. And I'll, I'll stop there. Probably gone on for too long already. Great, thank you. Um, Joe, do, is there anything you wanted to, to react to here? Mm, some great comments there from uh, Yola, absolutely on the money there. Um, uh, so yes, uh, there, there. Uh, when, when I, when I said that that, uh, that that one struggles in many fields to find um, both women submitting um, articles and certainly, you know, asking people to review, I certainly wasn't referring to many aspects of EU law, particularly EU anti-discrimination law, which is much more feminised. Um, but it does still have this distinct uh, racial problem. So while I, I agree with um, Ulad that overwhelmingly um, the production line is, is from women, I think in a way that's, that is a problem. And I think you acknowledge that, that uh, it's important that, that, that uh, um, men step up as well and, and work in this area because it's conceptually interesting as well as being politically and socially, societally important. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, much of my time at the moment now is 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 uh, is considering many of the questions that um, that Iola is is um, is talking about, like the pipeline of of, of students. We uh, we do have more students of colour in Edinburgh. I'm sure we have significantly fewer than than in, in many universities in um in in england and probably significantly fewer than than leeds um because partly because uh S scotland's demographic is more white also because our our demographic of, of students who come to do our our llb which is a scots law llb is is much is far more dominated by the white scottish middle class than it should be so we have a starting point that is very problematic nonetheless our our, our classes are um, much more diverse than than they they ever were, and I'm I'm currently teaching an honours course, so that's a third and fourth year uh, specialised course on on citizenship in in national and global perspectives, and it's by far the most diverse um, group of students that I've ever taught. Um, and I might come back to some of the issues that that raises under the second question that that Ivana put to us around. Um, the types of challenges we might face in in the classroom, whether that's and um, um, you know problems around uh, people pushing back against um, progressive ideas, what one might call progressive ideas, but also as it were the clash of different perspectives in the classroom, which can be a challenge. But institutionally, as a as a head of school, I'm also facing the 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 issue that 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 my relatively small number of color, colleagues of color are disproportionately required uh, or requested to, to serve in all sorts of ways within the university, which has an overwhelmingly white um, senior leadership. And it's it's not hard to make them, it's not very difficult to make them feel embarrassed about it, but actually very, very little is happening in, in that sphere. And I'm sure that's very true in 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 institutions right across uh, right across um, uh, Europe and, and represented um, and beyond, of course, and represented in this this group. Um, some somebody did ask a, a, a question in in the chat about ideas to improve anti discrimination law. This is Nuria Ramos Martin. Uh, thank you for 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 that, uh, Nuria. Um, 
yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not the best person to answer that because I'm not the person who's who's really involved in working with anti-discrimination law at the moment. But it it, it always strikes me that uh, that that one 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 of the problems with a the liberal legal liberal legalist model of of discrimination law is that it reduces things down to individualized relationships legal and and uh, or gives a legal spin to what are fundamentally social relationships and that um that and and that's highly in, highly individualized and that that is both less less effective in terms of um, what the outcomes are in individual cases, but is also potentially corrosive in terms of its impact upon individual litigants. So I've always, I've always um, been very sympathetic to any argument that tries to collectivize the legal process in 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 constructive ways. But I recognise that people have been trying to redesign that. Well, very much in the US, where they have used certain types of collective litigation more successfully, but. But, you know, in, in the UK and more broadly under EU anti-discrimination law to look at different ways in which we might be able to collectivize the legal process so that um, the judiciary can remain important players in the conversation, um, but not at the cost of the individual litigants who or, or the or the. Um, or because of a lack of supply of qualified advocates who who can't actually, or or because it's too expensive to access to, to access justice. So yes, I'm very sympathetic to that, but I'm not particularly uh, quali well qualified to comment on exactly what progress has been made in different countries, or um, you know what things really work and what don't. Okay, great. I, I think that I want to move to the sort of second question and then open it up for, for people who have questions. There are many questions in the chat, and I'm sure that you'll have a lot of questions you want to ask. So the, the second question um, that I that I ask you to, to think about relates to the current sort of political and broader social moment. So various transnational social movements and political forces uh, have set their targets on critical race theory and gender studies and feminism. So Ja and Yola talk a little bit about that. Um, and I think it is um, an interesting moment precisely because it comes both from populist, what we call populist far right governments or political parties, but also from more progressive and moderate uh, ones. And here I'm thinking uh, about recent attacks on scholars in France coming from uh, various members of Emmanuel Macron's government who accused them of islamo gauchism mainly of fostering radical, radical Islam. Um, so intersectionality, for instance, was very clearly and explicitly linked to um, fostering radical, radi radical Islam in, in, in France and of being un-Republican. So how do you interpret this uh, this backlash, why is it happening right now? Maybe, you know, from our perspective, is it anything new? I mean, maybe we've been dealing with this for, for, for a very long time and this is just the sort of last, um, the, the latest stage of it. Um, and does it in any way impact your scholarship, your teaching, your experience in the classroom? So, so, so any fact. So, I'm just stating it as a fact that has been going on for 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 decades now. So, um, um, the the and the problem. So, I I, I do want to just say that the the you know your perception that in some way critical approaches are dominant in the EU law I, I honestly don't see that I don't see feminism taking over or gender studies we mentioned gender studies I don't see gender studies I see some strands of feminism um, I see a lot of people using words such as you know that come from critical studies or intersectionality but don't do much with that so that I see I do not think that 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 we have a uh, critical approaches taking the, the center stage. Uh, and, and, and of course, my perception is that I don't, I don't see cancel culture, I'll see quite opposite, but I'm gonna let, uh, let uh, Iola, Joe, and then we're gonna uh, open it up. So please, if you could just make some brief, uh, yeah, uh, brief remarks, and then we're gonna open it up and you'll be able to, to come back to some of that. 
Okay, I'll be brief. My first comment is that I think we should all immediately head to the Asset Institute because there's obviously a critical mass there that we are not aware of if we are to take Ulad's comments <laughs> as, as, um, as, as, uh, as, as correct. I mean, you must be working in a wonderful environment there, um, Ulad, and uh, yeah, I, I, I look forward to visiting you there. Um, but my, my particular comments on this um, on this aspect. I mean, it, it, it's so interesting. I think this this cultural uh, backlash that that isn't just uh, happening in in Europe, but also, of course, in, in America. Um, I think paradoxically, it's it's actually helped those of us who engage in in critical uh, research because before people stood up in the British Parliament to to mention its name, I doubt many of my my compatriots had even heard of critical. Um, race theory. Now, of course, the the the, the negative, as Ulad said, there are pros and cons. So the pro, the 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 advantage, is that many, many, many people, many, many, many more people now know that something such as critical race theory exists. Uh, the disadvantage, of course, is that they they don't really know what it is, um, because the 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 way in which it has been presented to them is is very misleading. So I, I agree with you, Ivana, that um, there is uh, much surface, uh, superficial um, use of terminology that comes from critical perspectives, but uh, a real lack of substantive engagement with with the work that's behind those fields. And, and yeah, intersectionality, I think, is, is um, one area that falls into that. I've always found it very, um, very uh, curious, you know, that in places such as France and Germany that are in many, many ways so progressive and uh, can be so culturally open and, and, you know, have such creative thinkers really do have this kind of block when it comes to, in particular, crit race and critical race approaches. Um, and I, I just find that such a, a fascinating um, phenomenon um, and I don't have any explanation to answer your question, Ivana, as to why that is. Um, but that 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 is just the 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 way the that that culture the culture in these countries is. Um, there is more openness, I think. I mean, the fact that you are organising such events um, in in Amsterdam is um, evidence for me that, that that there has been a shift, and evidence for me that even if there is this backlash. There are um, enough critical voices uh, within institutions to challenge that. The difficulty is, and to come back to my previous point, is that there aren't enough voices from people of colour. So when you do have um, politicians uh, or leading scholars condemning something like critical race theory, there just aren't enough voices to, um, to push back. And so that narrative really dominates the, the, the agenda, dominates the, the public discourse, and that is what people will remember. So there really does need to be uh, a, a strong, stronger attention paid to um, uh, creating a, a critical mass that can push back against such, um, such attacks from, from, from people in positions of power because that's what it is really. It's a manifestation of power and privilege. Um, and it's, a, it's an attempt, I think, to, to undermine the, the amazing um, global and intergenerational, intergenerational solidarity that was seen um, in response to the murder of George Floyd and the, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I think it, it's a pushback against that. That hasn't changed my approach. That's, actually given me more opportunities to talk about critical race theory. Um, so a few months ago, I was invited to, to talk about critical race theory to the Sentencing Council in the, in the UK, which is a council which um, talks about sentencing policy. Um, I'm going to, to talk with some, um, some barristers about critical race theory. So it's just helped me to, to identify more, um, more spaces and more audiences to talk um, to about critical race theory. Great, thank you, Yola. Uh, Joe, could you, can I just ask you to be brief because I want to open <laughs> Yeah, no, sure, of course. To the, 
Yeah, I, 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 I really, I, I'm a bit triggered by some of the things that Ulad said, but I, I'm, I'm not going to really directly address them. But I'm going to tell a story instead. So, um, so I spend a lot of my time, obviously, dealing with and teaching um, uh, young adults, um, many of whose experiences so far away from my life experience as a grammar school educated middle class white woman brought up in the the 60s and 70s in the UK and who went to university when it was basically free, etc., etc and who benefited from the massive feminization of British universities such that I got a you know got a chair at the impossibly a, a fairly impossibly early age and have had a chair longer as a as an academic than I was ever a lecturer or a senior lecturer so you know I'm I'm a person of huge privilege one of the most um moving things I did I think it was not long before um before lockdown, uh, uh, one one of the student groups, student societies, uh, invited Kimberly Crenshaw to come and talk about um, uh, uh, intersectionality. And you know, the, the tickets were like gold dust, even though it was in our largest uh, lecture theatre. Um, and uh, I, uh, with like five hundred people or more than that, and and it was still packed, and there were still people waiting outside. And I think they might have streamed it, and so on and so forth. And you realise this massive massive unmet need for an engagement by particularly young black women who i'd know you know i had no idea i guess every young black woman in the university was there probably and all the other universities and and school students and so on and so forth and this voice this urge for a voice and for an engagement with those sorts of questions and that's that is much greater now, in, certainly in British universities, can't speak for, for other places, but certainly that mainstreaming and that, you know, that acceptance of, of that we need to have a conversation around those questions and that, um, you know, it, it, it isn't tedious to keep saying, you know, these things do impact more, more significantly, significantly upon those who are socially and economically marginalized. Um, it isn't tedious to say that. Um, and it isn't downplaying wider democratic engagement with issues around, for example, as you mentioned them, the lockdowns, but it isn't tedious to, to keep insisting on that point. So that's all I'll say. Thank you. Thank you.